This is the short story of the amazing legendary folk rock band Glass Castle. The group originated in the home county's city of St Albans in the UK in the mid-1970s and consisted of just two highly talented yet emotionally obscure musicians called Milk Castle and Sid Glass. Their preeminent musical talents were galvanized in 1976 when their inimitable yet formidable duo called Glass Castle was formed. Milk Castle and Sid Glass grew up on a third-rate council estate in the leafy but smoky North London suburbs of Hertfordshire. attended the same schools, walked the same streets, stole sweets from the same shops, rode the same bikes and often the same girls during their grossly unstable adolescence. They even shared the same buses to the same pubs and parties and it was during such impetuous transportation jaunts that the two musicians got chatting about their combined musical talent and their future. It wasn't long before they hatched a plan to form a band, and the rest, as they say, is history. In the mid-1970s, after being ceremoniously dispatched from Harpenden Borstal, Milk was originally a lead guitarist in a huge local garage band called the Batchwood Molesters, in which he played raucous chords on an electric Fender Stratocaster. Ironically, Sid played triangle in the same band, and it was through this fortuitous chance encounter that the two became professional musical partners shortly after that time. Milk had been inspired by the musical compositions of Roger Whittaker and Roger Waters and desperately wanted to merge these unique and diverse styles by writing and performing similar score sheets of his own that would draw upon the combined success of those artists. So in his secluded home, which was later to become his hideout, Milk started to write day and night and practiced to near perfection his playing techniques on both 6 and 12 string acoustic guitars as well as a Lewis Electric in the cold comfort of his otherwise quiet and dark home. Sid grew up on the same run-down estate in the 1960s and lived only 10 minutes walk from Milk. He appeared to almost enjoy an early childhood and met and played with many girls and a little boy called Lefty Goldplatt, who, ironically, was to become one of Glass Castle's managers in the 80s. Throughout his teens, Sid became a typical archetypal maverick, chiefly because of gross parental mismanagement, and it was this and his associated anger that fueled and influenced his odd yet prolific contributions in later Castle songs that gave them such a unique audible flavour and attraction. Even as time went on in these early days, Glass Castle's music was being subjected to all sorts of heavy influences, not least by the members of the notorious Axe and Hammer Motorcycle Club, to which both Sid and Milk belonged. The club had a major effect on the future of the band's songwriting. In fact, the musician Roy Harper once said that, had it not been for Castle's integration with the Axe and Hammer Club, their music would have probably lost that grittier edge and they would have ended up sounding more like Val Doonigan or some other fireside act. During the time of Glass Castle's inception, much of the draft songwriting material was simply discarded. But then, in October 1976, 
Milk's first serious piece, Dancing Feet, was completed and rehearsals took place at Sid's house in Lawrence Road, St Albans, which was later converted to a state-of-the-art recording studio. Such was the gravity of the attractive chords, lyrics, articulate guitar playing, Sid singing and the overall sound that Dancing Feet simply couldn't fail, and it soon became their first hit single. The success of their first number gave Milk and Sid the inspiration to write and perform more music, and to build upon this initial success, which already earned them a significant local female groupie following that they exploited with full vigour. Soon, with rehearsals and recording sessions being almost equally split between the now famous Lawrence Road and Furfield Lofts studios, which were Sid and Milt's respective residences at the time, more songs were successfully produced under a variety of different record labels. Train, Girl, Smoke from the Factories, Time, Down the Road, In the Country and Floating on a Cloud all followed in quick succession between 1977 and 1981, before their epic single Ardne in November 1981, with its aggressive lyrics that were inspired by an acrimonious relationship breakup involving Sid and a hostile prostitute from a rival estate, the name of the lady concerned being spelt backwards in the title of the song. The pressure and stress of belonging to what was, by this time, a high-profile band, as well as the live concert demands and expectations of its fans, meant that a manager had to be found quickly. Initially, Sony Music's Kevin Langdon, shown here on the left at a Glass Castle promotional event in 1980, was commissioned. He did much to set Castle on the right technical track, but he was soon headhunted and returned to Sony Music USA within three months. Then, electrician and marketeer Lefty Goldblatt, in the centre of this rare photograph, quickly became Kev L's replacement for the prestigious Castle set. He took the credit for the success of their 1981 hit, You Are The Only, after which, in the words of Melody Maker, Glass Castle went glacial. Having grown up with Sid, and being aware of Milk's peculiar ways first-hand, Lefty hit the ground running, and ended up managing the group's administrational arm, Glass Castle Logistics Incorporated, which looked after concert venue procurement, such as their first successful gig at New Green's Hall St Albans in 1981, and the group's roadie and transportation requirements. In fact, Lefty procured Castle's first van, and subsequently used it to drive the group and its equipment to the countless venues all over the city, including gigs at the Blue Anchor and the Ancient Britain public houses. During this era, Lefty was found to have split interests of a musical and sexual nature, and had financial interests with the lead guitarist of rock band Pyramid, and their hordes of loose women followers. So, until things with Lefty settled down, a temporary substitute manager for Glass Castle, Kevin Allen, was hired at great cost from Warner Brothers Records and Tapes. Kevin became the hard-working strategy guru that culminated in Castle producing the successful He's Back single and alcoholic romance number, together with cover versions of Floyd's Pigs on the Wing, Ronnie Lane's How Come, Bob Dylan's Sarah, and a few Beatles tracks. Milk, in the mid-80s, however, did other things, including some solo work at obscure venues in Wiltshire. Sadly, throughout the 90s, Glass Castle effectively stagnated into virtual oblivion. A handful of remixes of old material were undertaken and released worldwide, but these didn't chart anywhere. Gradually, both Milk and Sid became reclusive, as the Hollywood dream and the global massive stage performances simply whittled away. Even Sid's deal with Parlophone in 1998, although much celebrated at the time, was short-lived, 
due to the acute lack of new material. By the turn of the century, communication between Milk and Sid became difficult to say the least. A fanzine, The Watchtower, was still being produced that eventually gained a cult following, but it did little to achieve any serious castle comeback, principally due to the fact it became increasingly difficult to locate either band member. Lefty remained in harness with the band, such as it was, and was retained alongside Kevin Allen to oversee a 2002 surprise return of sorts in the shape of the release of the single and album Melting Sky, the title track being commissioned by EMI as incidental music that featured in a 30-minute TV documentary program about the world's smallest principality. The album Melting Sky also carried a solo track by Sid that was tagged on the end, Frog and Toad, which became an iconic piece as it epitomised Sid's pitiful mental state at that time. In spite of sales that resulted in its platinum disc, the overall failure of Melting Sky appeared to be the catalyst that led both musicians into a significant emotional abyss. By 2003, Damage Limitation was the name of the game to save the band, and to this end, Lefty arranged a record company deal that was to see Milk and Sid back in the studio to produce an EP of a 2003 remix of the hitherto successful song Colours. But by this time, Sid was clearly the worse for wear, as this rare footage of the already broken man from that year sadly testifies. I just want you to say that we, we have just, Glass Castle have just released a new single and it's called Colours, very nice album Colours and the most played it seems is the single Colours Reprise and don't forget the latest edition of the Watchtower magazine which is packed full of interesting things about myself and milk. Anyway, it's only a short thing because I can't really do interviews very well. So it's just to say, uh, I don't know really what it's to say. But anyway, uh, hey, all right. Uh, it's just to say that uh, I'm going back to Sealand. Milk is going back to Lundy where he will carry on with his work with the sensational Alex Harvey Band, now known as the sensational Stephen Messenger Band, and uh, we hope that uh, this may be the last ever piece of work we do. But just to say thank you to all our fans for buying uh, all the singles, uh, and also for Melting Sky, for buying Melting Sky as well, and the, the CD Melting Sky, which I think has, has been sold a platinum disc now or something. So anyway, thank you to all our fans and please continue to buy our records because it does help. I don't know what it helps, but it helps something. Anyway, thank you and goodbye. Sales of the Colours EP were buoyant, but barely impressive on an international scale. By this time, the recording studios at Thurfield Lofts and Lawrence Road had both been repossessed and the use of the famous Abbey Road site to conceive further Glass Castle material became cost prohibitive. Milk and Sid's last ditch attempt to revitalise Glass Castle and its ailing fanbase was painfully achieved in 2005 with the recording of what was to be their last ever work together. It was at this time that a German version of the 2003 Colours remix was produced, Das Faber. As Milk refused point-blank to record any more work above and beyond this piece, it was then left to Sid to write, produce and record the flip side, Janitor's Spanner, yet another portrayal of the singer's dysfunctional mental state of that period. In a very confused TV interview in Liechtenstein in 2005, Sid attempts to explain Castle's post-millennium work but with obvious chronological and factual disarray. Uh, there's a track called You Are The Only, which it says here is, 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 uh, it says here that it's version 
two from the album Melting Sky and there is Colors 2003 instrumental which is the Milk Castle on his own. Now Milk Castle, uh, who's not so much of a recluse as I am, as you'll see in a minute on this same film, would you believe, hopefully, back in the UK they're going to take this camera. And uh, he has asked for a single to be produced to link Colours 2003 mix with Fading Colours. Reprise. And so we've come up, or the, 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 the powers that be in the studio have come up with this. It's the single. It's an amazing single. And some bright spark has actually welded these two inimitable tracks together and they've called it uh, Atmospheric Reprise 2003 at the request of Milk Castle himself and so I hope it sells a million Soon after that interview was filmed Sid emigrated to an ex-World War II Navy fortress to live his life as a nose-diving recluse in earnest. Traditionally, both Sid and Milk have always shunned interviews of any kind, and so it was of equal surprise when this quantifiably rare interview of Milk, from 2004, was discovered in the vaults of a TV news station in Ohio. Here's Milk being questioned by Glass Castle enthusiast Lord Melbury, while in the guitarist's residence in St Albans, a second home to his usual Lundy Island residence. The interview, which does not contain flash photography, helps to piece together some of the jigsaw of Castle's very fragmented and unstable status of that time. Where do you think Glass Castle is going? <laughs> well, I've known where it's been, but I've... It's not going nowhere. It never has gone anywhere. It never will go nowhere. It's a complete and utter dead duck. And what do you think of the latest EP colours? The sleeve's very nice. And the writing's very nice, but the music, who wants to listen to it? <laughs> who wants to listen to it? I just don't know. But you said it was absolutely a wonderful masterpiece in terms of um, in terms of musical content, lyrics, and so on and so forth. But I don't think I've been played on it. I don't think it was me. I think I think actually um, Sid got something else to play the guitar because it wasn't me. So I don't remember doing it. I I'm just totally perplexed by the whole thing. It's I I think it's just a whole complete and utter farce. The whole thing's a farce. So how th how are things now on on Lundy Island? Cold. Cold. I've run out of coal, but I've chopped all the trees down, and I've got nothing to burn. The cats have run off. I think I actually saw the cats swimming across the sea to, towards Bristol. I don't know what's happened to them. I'm, I just, I'm just regretting the whole fact that we're coming to winter because it's just so bloody cold. And who wants to live in the cold? But I'm thinking about getting some double glazed, well not double glazed, I'm thinking about getting some um, plastic over the windows to make sort of like artificial double glazing. Because, it, it, because it's just a complete and odd, oh, it's just a nightmare. But I used to be quite happy when I lived in Hertfordshire, but now I'm living in St Albans, um, no, not St Albans, where I'm now, Lundy Island even. It's, oh, it's just so cold. And that wind whips off the um, Irish Sea. Well, what about the, what about the uh, reprise? What about the reprise of, of Castle? Uh, the reprise of Colours? Actually, that is good. But again, I can't remember doing it. I, I, the, the, the vocals are very good, and, and the artistic whole setup is very good. But, oh, I don't know. But what, do you think Sid has actually lost it now forever, and this is the last work that he would ever do for Glass Castle, or do you think he'll do more? Sid lost it about 20 years ago. He did, he lost it about... Unfortunately, he just turned to women and wine. And ever since then, it's just, it's just gone completely and utterly belly up for him. 
I, I sometimes worry about his sanity. I don't even know why we're even bothering doing this, but but musically the reprise is is, is nice, but I, d I, I, I is it us? Is it really us? Do you think that it would chart? <laughs> it would chart, all right. No, it, may, it might be potential there. But whatever the potential is going to be, I've got no idea. But if we, who knows? It could have an effect. It might have an effect like a tornado running through a car lead. Or it could have an effect like sun breaking out in the sky over a lovely desert island. But I just don't know. But it, has, it would have an effect, that is for sure. Given Sid's virtual disappearance and certain disconnection with the band at this time, Lord Melbury went on to try to find out from Milk if Glass Castle could exist on the Ace guitarist's songwriting and performance abilities alone. Have you any, have you any music in the pipeline that's new? Well, I'm thinking about saying now, but I'm just... Uh... <laughs> But other than that, I've just, I, 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 actually I've lost all my chords. I know about three chords now. There's one here. And that's it. Other than that, it's all gone belly up. I'm afraid to say it's gone belly up. I know, but I've got another one, hang on. And that's it. <laughs> so no major classics for the future, for Glass Castle. Perhaps one day, when Sid decides that it's going to come down out of his, his whatever's happened to him, because he's become a complete nightmare, he really has. I, I just don't know, he's, he's become such a, a recluse, he just won't do anything, he just wants to... Oh, he's, he's, he's just lost it, he's totally and utterly lost it. He just, all he wants to do is hop around and jump around, eat raw meat, eat raw fish, he, he even drinks seawater. We know what seawater does. Well, he drinks seawater, even not eat seawater, he drinks seawater, but we know what it does to people. Drinking seawater makes you mad, but he's been mad for years. There was soon a universal acceptance that Sid would never return to being the debonair musician and performer he once was. And with Milk's growing popularity as leader of a new multi-million dollar group entitled the sensational Stephen Messenger Band, attention turned to his new and very different musical phenomenon that seemed a million miles from the heady days of Castle in the 70s and 80s. And what about the sensational Stephen Messenger Band? Is they're that going very well? Good. They are very good. And what about the album Microwave Man? Excellent. By the sensational Stephen Messenger Band is brilliant, and Microwave Man, the best album ever. Buy it. Any other good tracks on it apart from the title track? Well, Microwave Man. Mm. There's about three other good tracks. Um, fiddling with my fiddling my with my rudder is another brilliant is another brilliant track. It's about being lost in the boat, and also. <laughs> <laughs> also lost on the top of his scalp, which is about a scientist who gets lost on top of his scalp, or scalpel even. But I said, other than that, it's absolutely marvellous. Aren't you doing a track called Being Careful With Your Money? <laughs> no. <laughs> Today, Milk and Sid exist in quiet retirement. Ironically, it is Milk who has gone into a semi-reclusive state now, but the two of them do meet on very rare occasions. Having abandoned his Lundy Island home, Milk now resides at the remote home county's dwelling that once was Castle's original Furfield Lofts studios. He flatly refuses to give any more interviews, but has allowed us to portray some glimpses of his new life with his permanent psychiatrist, Sue Lee Hall. These are through press photography pictures taken chiefly in 2009. Sid, on the other hand, still recovers from the sudden loss of his first son and daughter in 2003 by living in a very remote hamlet in the far north of Scotland, his humble cottage there being heavily guarded and geographically and psychologically detached from what he describes 
a modern, stressful world in the grip of selfish capitalism. Amazingly, Sid's agent allowed us a brief interview in the closing weeks of 2009, during which, amongst other things, Sid reflects on an incredible music career that was clearly emotionally stimulating, yet injurious to both him and Milk. No, I'm so spoiled. It is you. Hang on a sec. Excuse me. Hi, hi. Hi. Where's my chips? They're on your plate. No, they're not. There they are. The bigger, fuller, bouncier, double breasted burger from Nando's. Yes, it was an incredible music career, I suppose you could say. Uh, I never thought it would last much beyond 1980, but it got as far as 2005, and I suppose, really, um, we've done well for it to get that far. If you consider the, the venues that we used to play at, such as New Greens Hall, where we were heckled terribly, um, the recording studios we had at Thurfield Lofts, Lawrence Road, the engineers involved, we had Lefty, of course, uh, we had Kev L, who was brilliant. Um, some of the business management decisions that were made with Kevin Allen later on uh, held us together for a while. It was, it was good, really. We were lucky that we had people falling into place at the right time. Milk was doing extremely well. He obviously worked tirelessly in terms of um, um, writing, practicing, penning music, chords, different instruments. Um, how he ever got any other work done, we don't know. Um, but he, he did very well. And I worked quite hard, I suppose, on the lyrics, although some of them seemed to just fall out of my pen. You know, it was one of those lucky, uh, without wishing to sound um, sort of bullish about this, uh, it, I was lucky in terms of being able to write fairly prolific lyrics fairly easily. Uh, so we were lucky there and that was quite well applauded by the music press of course at the time and um, yeah I think I think that we were lucky uh, in from many angles, many angles indeed. Um, but there was also a great deal of unluckiness there as well with um, certain record labels and so on not really giving us too many favours uh, well, there were favours, but I mean, you know, uh, there were there were obstacles in the way. But any band that makes any mark on the music scene would experience those. Um, it's not an easy ride when you start to make records and get decent sales. And we were no exception to that sort of law of the universe in the music world, I suppose. Um, it is it is tough when things. Uh, but you know, when we, when we made Ardne and You Are The Only, you know, and they're both platinum disc records, uh, and you suddenly become um, one of the biggest rock, folk rock bands in the world, you suddenly think, well, what's next? You don't know what you're in it for anymore. You know, it's, uh, we all want to be rich and famous. And uh, when you've achieved that goal, um, you suddenly don't know w why you're doing this anymore. It becomes a difficult, thing to grapple with and you look for new motivations and I suppose when those motivations actually um, if you like transpired um, exhausted themselves we started to lose direction uh, other things pulled us in different directions on family traumas and so on and I suppose that coupled with the lack of motivation, given the success of Ardne, You Are The Only, and a couple of other tracks like Melting Sky, uh, it all culminated in, um, the, you know, the end really, for which was 2005, it just happened to be 2005. I think that's just how it all sort of fizzled by that time. 
a shame, but um, I, I've got no regrets. A fantastic, fantastic um, amount of uh, amount of work and achievement, and a lot of people were saying, "Crikey, you know, uh, you've come from nowhere, and look, look what this is all about." You know, the two uh, council estate guys from uh, well, middle low caste backgrounds. Well, originally I played the Rayburn drums, uh, the Rayburn gas fire drums, and um, as basic a kit as it was, uh, it produced a good sound for the early songs, like uh, Floating on a Cloud and, and other things like that. Um, but we clearly had to graduate from there, and so um, a more conventional drum kit was eventually commissioned and employed, and we used that. Uh, as for bass, well, we... It was obvious, actually, from the early days that we lacked in bass accompaniment. Um, and it wasn't until we got uh, a bassist in that we realised that we were missing out on the richness of the sound of Castle, really. Yeah, John Dorr came in uh, at Milk's request to enrich the sound, which was clearly lacking in the bass area of some of the castle songs in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and he played bass, electric bass guitar for us for a while. Um, he was pulled out of a group called Pyramid, who I actually sang for. It's a heavy rock band based in Harpenden. And um, he did very well for a couple of numbers, but I think he soon got tired of the folk rock scene. And he went back to Pyramid on the more heavy rock scene. Uh, and he eventually just disappeared. Uh, and we tried to find another bassist, but uh, unsuccessfully. So I said, well, look, I said to Milk, look, the best thing we can do here is, is, is improvise until we find someone. And so I played bass synthesizer over tracks like You Are The Only and a few others, um, which after some careful engineering with the electronics on the synthesizer and some practice on my part, um, it sounded convincing enough for some further music to be released, so it was. And you are the only, in fact, the bass on that is me playing bass synth, overdubbed with a descant of a lead and a lead itself, another descant, a mouth organ, a pl application of some echo, um, and I think we double tracked Milk on a 6 and a 12 string guitar for that track, so it was quite complex, a lot going on in that piece of music really. Uh, and that was quite interesting. That was quite, yeah, that was one of the most interesting things. In the end, we didn't find another bassist and we just kept going uh, along those lines with overdubbing of uh, a bass synth with me doing the best I could. And it stayed like that right up to the end, in fact. Even on my solo tracks with uh, like Janitor Spanner and Frog and Toad, um, there was a lot of overdubbing and things like that. So yeah, it, was, it, it worked. It seemed to work. Yeah. Well, probably Milk was um, of a middle upper class background and I was of a middle lower class background because I lived in a council house, which was Lawrence Road Studios, and Milk lived in a private dwelling, which, given the location and everything, was regarded as rather special at the time, a sort of um, salubrious, really. And so we almost came, came from the same backgrounds, but not quite. Uh, I think, I suppose, in terms of class, Milk always had the edge on me for... And, and, and Lefty, I suppose, I was in the same sort of bracket, really, as, as Lefty Goldplatt, because he, he was essentially from the same pigsty mould as me. Um, and and there, therefore, you know, uh, that was that. As for people like Kevell, fantastically, uh, mansion dwelling guy, Sony USA, very hardworking and successful uh, in the music and electronics industry. Kevin Allen, of course, again, um, resident of uh, Chilikbury Mansion, um, pots of money. I think his uh, mum was a baroness and his father was an earl or something so they came from very very good backgrounds and um i still are i think they applaud us for us getting this far i suppose but yeah that's that yeah very worthwhile
very worthwhile. But, but sad to see it all go, I suppose. But we've all got the CDs now, so that's good. So, what of the future? Like many failed rock musicians that once enjoyed all the trappings of stardom and the money and female fruits that go with it, now this has all but vanished. Milk struggles on a day-to-day -day basis in his quiet and reclusive existence with his permanent psychiatrist. With only occasional visits to the seaside, Milk finds sanctuary within his sedentary life in the quiet, leafy but smoky home county's town that has now been engulfed by the filth and cultural diversity of cosmopolitan London. He has no desire to research anything to do with Glass Castle. In fact, sources close to Milk say that he has no desire, full stop. As for Sid, with him living so far away from anywhere, in Scotland's flow country, also with a permanent psychiatrist, it is very unlikely that he will ever write or perform music again, either as a solo artiste or otherwise. In fact, both former artists have stated they do not want to pursue a solo music career. So Glass Castle 1976 to 2005, rest in peace. Thank you for the music. Honda 350 number RNM 77M departs from the bottom of Blinking Close. For further information about this legendary band, look out for the official Glass Castle website. A selection of Glass Castle songs are due to appear on YouTube soon. <laughs> 